Hello, and welcome to Finding the Right Tool for the Job, CE Tools That Improve Efficiency and Save Time. This is the third webinar in the six-part Future Trends in Forensic DNA Technology series. My name is Michelle Taylor, Editor-in-Chief of Forensic, and I will be your moderator throughout. For today's webinar, you can earn one hour of continuing education credit. Following the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email with information on how to obtain CE credit documentation. We have a great lineup scheduled to present to you today, but before we begin, I'd like to take just a moment to cover a few logistics. At the end of the presentations, we will hold a question and answer session. To ask a question, click on the Ask a Question tab in the upper right corner of your screen. Please also take note that the right side of the screen features an overview of today's webinar, as well as more information about our speakers. If you have a technical question during today's event, click on the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access additional webinar support. We also invite you to use the social media widgets beneath the webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. Today, you will be hearing from Jamie Brockhold, Senior Technical Application Scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific. In her current role, she provides troubleshooting and technical support to forensic laboratories globally and offers subject matter expertise as new products are introduced into the human identification portfolio. Prior to joining Thermo Fisher Scientific, Brockhold earned an MS in Forensic Science with a concentration in Criminalistics from the University of New Haven and went on to work in the Forensic Biology Unit at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory. You will also hear from Robert O'Brien, Forensic Biology Section Lead at Florida International University. O'Brien evaluates equipment and techniques used in biological collection and DNA analysis. His technology evaluations have been published as reports, presentations, and scientific posters at industry events and as reference publications. He also advises operators on tests and techniques available for field use in biological sample detection and screening. O'Brien develops curricula for forensic DNA and serology testing programs, delivering instruction both in person and remotely, something that's very important right now. Thank you for joining us for our third session in the six-part Future Trends in Forensic DNA Technology webinar series. After the webinar, please be sure to check your email for more information on CE credit documentation. We look forward to seeing you on August 20th for part four, tips, tricks, and best practices for gaining efficiency in your forensic DNA laboratory. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Jamie to get us started. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michelle. Uh, my presentation today is focusing on new features in our latest CE data collection software programs that will help improve efficiency and save time. We're going to be discussing enhancements in the 3500 data collection version 4.0.1, and also new features of the Seek Studio instrument and Seek Studio data collection version 1.2.1. Here's a quick overview of what the presentation will cover. Uh, we'll discuss at a high level the new features of the latest software versions on each of the CE instruments. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into great detail on all of the new features, but we will get to drill down into the pull-up reduction aspects, which are similar, but do have slight nuances for each instrument. After reviewing the technicalities behind pull-up reduction, we'll jump into an STR kit comparison where we can compare pull-up and data analysis across five STR kits, two from Applied Biosystems and three from other manufacturers. So we'll get started talking about the new enhancements in the 3500 data collection software version 4.0.1. After taking in a lot of customer feedback uh, since we first released the 3500 with data collection, we were able to include some great benefits with this newest version. Um, as it relates to improved data interpretation, we did introduce an algorithm that will reduce pull-up peaks for applied biosystems chemistry, and this is what's going to be covered in a lot more detail in the upcoming slides. Uh, we also optimize signal across the capillaries, and we did this in two ways. On a 24 cap system, we introduced a spatial optimization to account for optical variation across the 24 capillaries. And on both the 24 and 8 cap instruments, we have a recommendation for a Z offset uh, or a higher position in the well when the capillaries go into the well for injection, and that can be uh, performed by an engineer uh, during a routine uh, PM or when they first install the software by doing an auto sampler calibration. 
We also introduced uh, an algorithm for reducing off-scale data for databasing labs or those labs running robust single source reference samples. Um, off-scale data uh, recovery, what it does is it lifts the cap off the top end of the dynamic range. So right now where your data is capped or off scale around 32,000. Um, if you're running with off scale data recovery, that cap is lifted up to about 65,000. Um, also, you will see pull up uh, related to off scale peaks reduced. You do see a little asterisk here that mentions GeneMapper IDX version 1.6 for full functionality of the off scale recovery feature. And that is because it's only in version 1.6 that you'll see that cap lifted up to 65,000. If you analyze these HID files in earlier versions of IDX, you will see reduced pull up. Um, you will see reduced pull up also as it relates to the off scale data but you won't see that cap lifted up to 65K. You'll still get the off-scale indicator when peaks reach about 32,000. We also aimed to improve the user experience and a lot of feature requests went into to these uh, enhancements. The first thing we did was we added a plate loading flexibility where you can pause a run, bring the auto sampler forward, add a second plate and restart the run. You also, if you have two plates on, could pause a run uh, after the first plate is completed. For example, pull the auto sampler forward, take the first plate off, put a third plate on, and start the same run. And that's continual. We also added a 6 die installation standard. So on earlier versions of software, the installation standard for the HID performance check was done running Identifiler Ladder. You can now have the option to run a five die with Identifiler Ladder, same as before, or a new six die with Global Filer Ladder uh, performance check. We included, like I mentioned, other feature requests, things like being able to export the injection list, um, have a consumable log that is very easy to read to see when consumables were taken off or put on the instrument uh, and by whom. So those are a couple other ones, but there is a full list of all the new features uh, in the um, data collection um, user bulletin. This data collection version 4.0.1 is Win10 supported. Talking a little bit about the Seek Studio, which is our newest CE instrument. Um, for those that don't know, the Seek Studio is a four cap CE instrument. Um, a couple ways that we are gonna save time with this instrument is there is an automatic optical alignment, meaning that when the capillary is installed um, on the instrument, the spatial is automatic. So no need to run that manually. Uh, there's also an automatic spectral calibration adjustment or also called in the literature auto calibration and we're going to be talking more about that feature but basically you only need to run a manual spectral you have to only set up a spectral one time for each die set on the instrument and after that you don't have to run a manual calibrate spectral calibration again you can see that this instrument is pretty small um, the dimensions are there so a nice easy easy to lift, easy to move uh, instrument fit on a small bench top space if that is concern in your lab. The data collection software is run right on the instrument itself. There is a touch screen that you do everything on. Uh, you set up your plates, you can monitor your run, you view results. So there's no need to have a computer um, attached to this instrument at all. The consumables, we have an all-in-one reagent cartridge, which you can see sitting in front of the instrument um, in the picture here. Everything but your cathode buffer is in this easy to handle cartridge. Um, your array is here, uh, your polymer is here, and your polymer sits in a little insulator that when, put into, when the cartridge is put into the instrument stays chilled, which gives the polymer a six month on instrument um, storage lifetime. Your anode buffer reservoir is in the cartridge and your polymer delivery system. The cartridge is RFID tagged, as is the cathode buffer container, which will sit on the auto sampler. There's also no more plate sandwich. Um, the, the, your uh, CE plate sits right on the auto sampler, and then there's just a lid on the auto sampler that closes down um, over the septa that's on your plate. GMIDX version 1.6 is the IDX version that can read the .fsa files coming from the Seek Studio data collection software. 
so no longer .hid files on this instrument and software. Uh, and then there's also some adjunct software, which is optional to use. Um, you'll get an SAE module that uh, you can use to set up different users and different permissions within the software and on the instrument. And then there's also a Seek Studio plate manager, which can be used um, to help set up your plate uh, maps that can be imported into the instrument. I should also mention it is a single polymer type. Um, it is a POP1 polymer for sequencing, general fragment analysis, and uh, STR um, fragment analysis. So only POP1. So if you're running different applications on the Seek Studio, you don't have to worry about changing your polymer out. Um, it is a 28 centimeter capillary array. I don't think I mentioned that um, either. All right, so let's get into the pull-up reduction features that, that are included with these data collection versions. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we'll do a quick overview of pull-up. Um, we'll talk about definitions and expectations first. So generally, we expect that pull-up peaks are gonna be within the range of one to 3% of the parent peaks that they fall underneath. With off-scale data, we do know that these values could be slightly higher. So you may see pull up above that 3% uh, more often when you're talking about an off-scale sample. When we talk about pull up, there are really two different types of pull up. There's spectral pull up and there's instrument specific pull up. Spectral pull up occurs because when we run our manual calibration, we're using pure dyes. The, the matrix for deconvolution that is generated from that pure dye calibration then gets applied to our samples. Well, in our samples, our dyes are, connect, are attached to DNA fragments, and that could affect the spectra differently. So the difference between the spectra from the dyes being attached to the samples and the dyes being attached to being pure dyes, excuse me, um, that difference is what causes the error that causes spectral pull-up. In the raw data, spectral pull-up, um, you can see a pull-up peak that sits directly centered under the parent peak, and the same is true in the analyzed data. When we talk about instrument-specific pull-up, um, it's a little bit different. Um, instrument-specific pull-up all has to do with the way that the fluorescent molecules move across the detection window. So as the fluorescent um, uh, tagged fragments move across the detection window, center in the window, and move out of the window, the spectrum shifts on the CCD. And what you end up seeing in the raw data is a sinusoidal shape underneath the parent peak. And then in the analyzed data, rather than seeing the pull-up peak centered under the parent peak, it will be shifted. Um, if there is instrument-specific pull-up and spectral uh, pull-up in the same dye channel at the same time, they would be additive. So you would see maybe a single pull-up peak, but the percentage might be slightly higher. So what does the pull-up reduction algorithm do on the 3500 in particular? So this is pull-up reduction on the 3500 data collection version 4.0.1. What the algorithm does is it allows the software to use sample-specific spectral data for AB die sets. That's chemistry using G5, J6, or J6T. So rather than using a matrix for deconvolution based on the manual spectral that was run, that pure die spectral, the algorithm uses um, data from the samples themselves. So it's a more accurate uh, deconvolution for those samples. If for some reason there is limited data in a particular sample, um, so if you think about like a low level sample where maybe there's only a few peaks, the algorithm is going to step back and say, hey, there's not enough data here for me to generate a spectral that is any better than the manual spectral that's, that's stored here. So rather than trying to do something with limited data, just revert back to the manual calibration. So even with um, samples that don't have you know, have a lower quality or less data, there still will be pull-up reduction. It will just be our traditional pull-up reduction based off of the manual spectral. But when there is good quality data available and the algorithm is able to generate a sample-specific matrix, um, it will. 
all pull-up reduction happens prior to the creation of the HID files, and that includes the when a sample-specific uh, data is being used. So any raw data that you see in IDX will already have the reduction applied. Now, when we talk about pull-up reduction on the Seek Studio, it's somewhat similar and somewhat different. So there are really two levels of pull-up reduction on the Seek Studio. The first level is called auto spectral or auto calibration. And it is similar to what we just talked about with the 3500 pull-up reduction feature. It is gonna use sample specific spectral data, but it's gonna do this for any die set. So it doesn't just have to be an AB chemistry. Um, any chemistry, will have the benefit of the auto spectral. Also similar to the 3500, if there's limited sample specific data, um, the algorithm will still apply some level of pull-up reduction. It's a little bit different. If a previous auto calibration matrix has been uh, run, so you've had a, at least one injection in a capillary with a particular die set that has generated an auto calibration, the software will revert back to that auto calibration. If there has never been um, an auto calibration in that capillary for that die set, then the software will go back to the manual calibration that was run. The second level of pull-up reduction on the Seek Studio is called marker to marker correction. And this is for applied uh, biosystem die sets only, G5, J6, and J6T. Here, um, we have taken into account marker to marker variation as it relates to pull up across the read region uh, of the chemistry. And this, uh, the software will apply an optimized correction factor for each marker in each kit. Um, and the way that you enable marker to marker correction is on plate setup, you'll select the chemistry that you're running. It's also similar to the 3500 in that all pull-up reduction takes place prior to the creation of the FSA files. So any data that you view in IDX will already have pull-up reduction applied. Moving on to the STR kit comparison. So this study that we did, um, we had some general conditions for the study that I'll cover here. We also use the same sample types for each chemistry and across the different instruments that we, we ran. So all amplification done on a Proflex PCR system. Analysis all done in GeneMapper IDX version 1.6. Um, we also analyzed using minimum peak amplitude thresholds, which I'll discuss um, in the upcoming slides. Uh, otherwise, we followed manufacturer's recommendations and parameters for each kit as it related to amplification and CE injection. You can see the kits listed um, in the uh, blue table. So Global Filer and NGM Detect, Glo excuse me, Global Filer IQC and NGM Detect were the two applied biosystems kits. Promega Fusion 6C and Promega PowerPlex ESI 17 Fast were two kits from Promega that we ran. And the Kyogen Investigator 24Plex QS kit um, was the kit from Kyogen. So five kits in total. You can see the different cycles that are re recommended, which is how we did performed amplification, and the different DNA inputs, either half a nanogram or one nanogram, depending on the kit. We ran what we call NP or non-probative samples. So we picked four samples that could be commonly um, encountered by a laboratory. So the first was a swab from a cell phone, the next a cigarette butt, swab from a baseball hat, and blood on cotton. We also ran the kit positive control. We utilized 13500XL with data collection 4.0.1 and two different Seek Studio instruments with data collection version 1.2.1. So I mentioned that we used minimum thresholds for our analysis. And the way that we calculated a minimum threshold was we analyzed um, non-template control data for each of the kits on each instrument at one RFU. We went into the um, sample and edited out any pull-up. So that could have been spikes, pull-up from the size standard, or any other artifacts. Um, so if there was a dye blob or any raised baseline areas, that all got edited out. Um, once we were left with all the non um, 
artifactual data, we did some calculations to get to the limit of quantification. So we take the average peak height of all those peaks at one RFU plus 10 standard deviations, and that gets us to our LOQ. And this is the RFU value where you'd expect nearly all your noise to fall below. We took that LOQ and rounded it to the nearest five, and that was the minimum threshold. So for each die channel, we had a different minimum threshold. Um, if your LOQ was 22, we would have rounded down to 20 for the minimum threshold. On the 3500 instrument, uh, across the five uh, different chemistries, the minimum thresholds ranged from 35 to 85 across the dye channels. That's omitting orange, that's omitting the size standard. On the Seek Studio, if you recall, I mentioned we ran two different instruments, so the range is a, a little um, wider. The range was from 25 to 140 RFU across the dye channels, um, across all the chemistries um, for the two different instruments. Okay, I just want to, I use some, this term complex spectral artifacts when I start talking about the results of the study. So I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page with what I mean. Um, so traditional pull-up, that's pull-up that I'm going to be talking about that is pull-up that falls underneath a parent peak. It's very easy to calculate a pull-up percentage. So like the top figure that you see here. When I talk about complex spectral artifacts, th these are pull-up peaks that it's, more difficult to figure out maybe what the parent, which par parent peak um, is related to the pull-up uh, peak, or it can be like what you see in this figure here, a bridging effect, or what some people might call a pull-down effect, um, where you have, where we can count it as a spectral artifact uh, if these peaks were called, these red peaks, um, but I didn't calculate any sort of pull-up percentage to a parent peak here. So looking at the results on our 3500 for the pull-up assessment, um, applied biosystems kits, as a reminder, will have pull-up reduction enabled, so the use of sample-specific spectral data. Uh, the non-applied biosystems kits have pull-up reduction disabled, so that would just be using the traditional spectral calibration with those particular die sets. We had a positive control and four non-probative samples uh, for this analysis. So in the chart here, you see a, a, there's a left side and a right side. To the far right, you can see the count of that those complex pull-up peaks. So any pull-up peak that was counted, but a percentage wasn't calculated for. And then on the left side, um, you can see the more traditional pull-up peaks counted and then the percentages that were calculated. So overall, um, you can see if you look at the uh, average percent of the parent peak, which is in the, the third column here, this is um, all below 3%. So for all five uh, kits, the average pull-up was below 3%. You can see that in the non-applied biosystems kits, there was some pull-up above uh, 3% and even some pull-up above 5% uh, in the two Promega kits. And I just have a different way to look at this on the next slide, since this is a lot of numbers to look at quickly. Um, here, what you see across the um, x-axis are the five different kits. Across the y, up the y-axis, I should say, are the number of pull-up peaks. So that's traditional and complex counts of pull-up combined. The different colors in the bars themselves, um, the red indicates the count of complex pull-up peaks. The lightest blue is pull-up that was above 5%. The next shade of blue, pull-up below 5%. Uh, and the purple, pull-up that was below 3%. So what you can see um, overall is that the non-applied biosystems kits have at least three times the number of pull-up related artifacts compared to Global Filer IQC and NGM Detect. I wanted to put this into a relatable, uh, a relatable way to look at if you were an analyst in a lab. Um, so I wanted to consider time saving. So what does a three times reduction in the number of pull-up peaks look like uh, to someone who's uh, taking the time to analyze the data? So I had to start with an assumption. I said, let's say it takes about 30 seconds per pull-up edit. Um, I figured 
that was fair given that some peaks will be pretty easy to visualize as pull up others you'll have to go into the raw data maybe um, do some calculations things like that so i averaged about 30 seconds per pull up edit so we can say that if an applied biosystems kit had 70 pull up peaks in five samples which is similar to the data that we saw in this study a non-applied biosystems kit would have three times that, or 210 pull-up peaks in five samples. So that would mean that it would take someone 35 minutes to analyze uh, the applied biosystems kit, uh, with an applied biosystems kit, five samples, just the pull-up peaks, versus an hour and 45 minutes to analyze pull-up in five samples run with a non-applied biosystems kit. If you double that time, considering there has to be a secondary review, we're talking about an hour and 10 minutes um, to analyze an applied biosystems kit, five samples, just talking about pull-up, versus three hours and 30 minutes uh, for a non-AB kit, five samples, just talking about pull-up. So going over to the Seek Studio instrument, and if you remember, we had two different instruments, so this table is even a little bit busier than the last one we looked at. Um, as a reminder, Applied Biosystems kits will have the auto spectral enabled, enabled and marker to marker correction. The non-AB kits will just have auto spectral enabled. Again, it was a positive control and four non-probative samples that were analyzed. So, Again, on the far right, you can see those complex pull-up peak counts. And then on the left, you can see the traditional pull-up counts as well as the percentages that were calculated. Again, all kits had an average pull-up percentage of less than 3%. Um, all of the non-AB kits in this case had pull-up um, greater than 3% um, and, great, and a few had pull-up still greater than 5%. So for those that like to look at things in a different fashion, I much prefer this fashion. Um, very similar, five kits across the x-axis, the number of total pull-up peaks across, uh, up the y-axis. You can see um, broken down the complex pull-up that we saw in the non-AB kits, and then the different percentage levels um, in the blue and purple colors. You can see a difference between Global Filer IQC and NGM Detect as far as the number of pull-up peaks, 6 versus 21 for the two kits. And so when we compared the Applied Biosystems kits to the non-AB kits, I did split it out because there was that discrepancy. So for Global Filer IQC, the other kits had at least 13 times the number of pull-up related artifacts. And for NGM Detect, um, at least four times the number of pull-up related artifacts. Again, considering time saving, so how might this impact you if you're the analyst and or the reviewer? Um, again, I assumed 30 seconds per pull-up edit, but I did split it out uh, based on the difference we saw with Global Filer IQC and NGM Detect. So for Global Filer IQC, if there were three pull-up peaks in five samples, the other kits would have 13 times that or 39 pull-up peaks in those five samples. So this would mean a time savings from one minute uh, one and a half minutes, excuse me, to analyze the three pull-up peaks um, in Global Filer IQC versus uh, 19 and a half minutes in a non-AB kit. Doubling the time for review, you have it see a 33-minute savings in time. Uh, sorry, a 36-minute savings in time. For NGM Detect, um, which would have, let's say, 10 pull-up peaks in five samples, the other kit would then have four times that, or 40, 40 pull-up peaks in those samples. So for initial um, analysis, we're looking at five minutes versus 20 minutes, whether you're running NGM Detect or a non-AB kit. And doubling that time for review, you're talking about a 30 minutes time savings. So in conclusion, uh, pull-up reduction on both the 3500 and Seek Studio with the latest data collection software versions greatly reduced the number of pull-up related artifacts for the applied biosystems kits. On the 3500, it reduced uh, the pull-up artifacts by at least three times. On the Seek Studio, depending on the kit, four or 13 times the number of edits um, uh, reduction in the number of edits for the Applied Biosystems kits. And just as a reminder, the Seek Studio does have that added um, level of pull-up reduction, the marker-to-marker -marker correction. 
So taking into account the pull-up reduction and also some of the new features I talked about at the very beginning of the presentation, um, both the 3500 data collection version 4.0.1 and the Seek Studio with data collection version 1.2.1 can streamline data analysis, especially when used in conjunction with ABSTR kits. Thank you so much for your time. That concludes my presentation, and I'm going to pass the presentation over to Robert. Okay, so today um, I'm going to be talking about the right tool for the job. I am Robert O'Brien from the National Forensic Science Technology Center at Florida International University. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank Michelle and Jamie. Um, what I'll be talking about is the Applied Biosystems Seek Studio Genetic Analyzer for HID or the Applied Biosystems Rapid ID system. So the right tool for the right job, what we'll be looking at is the Seek Studio and the Rapid ID system. We'll be looking at systems and features, the instrument operation, the maintenance, and, any, and some data that we have run on both systems. So first, let's talk about the Seek Studio versus the 3500. So dimension-wise, the Seek Studio instrument has a width of about 49.5 centimeters, a depth of 64.8 centimeters, and height of 44.2 centimeters. Whereas the 3500 has a width of 61 centimeters, a depth of 61 centimeters, and a height of 72 centimeters. What it is important to note is that when you, for the 3500, you do need to have a clearance space about 122 centimeters in order to open the door. So the Seek Studio has a much smaller imprint than traditional C instruments like the 3500. Um, so it's definitely, it's going to be a shorter instrument and it's not as wide. Width usually makes it the most crucial factor um, since that dictates the space needed on a bench top, on a laboratory bench. So if you consider the space that is needed to open the door of the 3500, you can in fact fit two Seek Studios in that space. And the Seek Studio door actually opens upwards instead of um, off to the right. So therefore the opening of the door of the Seek Studio does not take up any additional space. The Seek Studio instrument is a cartridge-based instrument. The this puts the majority of the components of the CE system into one easy-to-change cartridge. The cartridge showed, shown contains a capillary array with four capillaries. The Palmer delivery system is actually part of the cartridge, with the detection window sitting behind the optical cover. The POP1 allows the same cartridge to be used for fragment analysis and sequencing. The anode buff is also contained inside the cartridge. The only other consumable that needs to be changed is the cathode buffer. So the cartridge system makes changing of the capillary array uh, very simple. This reduces the training time that is needed to ensure that you have a perfect alignment with the laser every time. A spatial does not need to be performed when inserting a new cartridge as the system performs an auto optical alignment every time it, you place in a new cartridge. Apart from the main cartridge, the cathode buffer and auto sampler are shown in the diagram as well, as you can see from the arrows. Um, it has a 96 well plate or eight strip tubes can sit directly on the auto sampler, which has a lid attached. So you know you do not need um, a plate holder as you did for the 3500. And this system uses the same plates as the 3500, so no special consumables will be needed if you switch it from the 3500 to the Seek Studio. A J6 spectral will be performed during the installation along with the HID install check, which uses Global File Ladder. Since the system has auto spectral calibration, as Jamie discussed, there is no need to run a manual spectral calibration other than a single time. The touchscreen display on the Seek Studio allows for full operation of the instrument, including plates set up on the instrument itself. This means that a separate computer system is not used to operate the instrument like 3500. So this, once again, is reducing the amount of space and the footprint of the instrument. However, a desktop or laptop is available to interface with the instrument for optional SAE control, a plate manager setup software, and or GMapper IDX version 1.6. The Seek Studio was tested against the 3500. Seek Studio's results were 100% concordant with the 3500 in the following data sets. We did 20 buckle swabs, reference samples, 
We did do a sensitive these series based on total input of DNA. However, these were all normalized to one nanogram. This actually data was used later on with the rapid ID. We did a sensitivity based on volume samples with four microliters, two microliters, one microliter, and 0.5 microliters. For saliva, we did eight microliters, four microliters, two microliters, and one microliter. And for mixture samples, we did a one to one, a one to four, a one to eight, and a one to 16. Once again, it's important to note that we ran the same plate that we ran on the Seek Studio with as a 3500, and we got 100% concordance between the two instruments. The one difference that was noted for the data analysis, the Seek Studio does require GeneMapper IDX version 1.6. And this also shows that the implementation of a Seek Studio does not in any way affect the quality of the data that you're going to get from your CE instrument. So now we're going to look at the Rapid ID system. The Rapid ID system, let's once again talk about instrument specifications. So the height is about 48 centimeters, the length is 53 centimeters, and it has a width of 27 centimeters. So therefore it makes it's very small and is very easily able to be placed into nearly any room, um, whether it's be in a laboratory or booking station, etc. The approximate weight is 28.4 kilograms with a primary cartridge installed and 25.4 kilograms without a primary cartridge. The only other space requirement that may be needed for this instrument is if you're going to have a laptop next to it to get the data coming off of the instrument itself. However, you can have that laptop in a centralized location and have the data sent to it. We'll talk about that later. So based on these dimensions, many of the instruments could be placed alongside each other. So you can actually have a bank of these instruments and they can easily expand the capability without requiring much more space than its larger predecessor, the Rapid 200. The weight of the instrument also makes the instrument itself an easy one-person carry, or in a case, it could be a two-person carry, which makes it ideal for transporting to crime scenes. The Rapid ID system is also a cartridge-based system. So it has a primary cartridge and a sample cartridge. This allows for easy operation and maintenance of the instrument, and because of the ease of use, very little training is required for the user. The primary cartridge contains the following. It, cont it has all the components necessary for CE. It contains the polymer, which is shipped separately and stored refrigerated. It is loaded into the primary cartridge before the cartridge is placed into the instrument. It contains the capillary and, ano capillary and anode and cathode buffers. The primary cartridge is guaranteed for 100 samples. In tests with continual daily use, it has been possible to get more than 100 samples out of the primary cartridge. The sample cartridges, there are two different sample cartridges. There's the ACE Global File Express cartridge with the purple label and the Rapid Intel cartridge with the pink label. The sample cartridges can be stored up to six months when refrigerated or for two months at room temperature. And both cartridges use the Global Filer Express chemistry. So let's look, talk a little bit more about the ACE versus the Intel cartridge. So the ACE Global Filer Express sample cartridge is intended for use with reference samples like buckle swabs. It can also be used for other high level samples that is, for example, blood and the runtime is approximately 90 minutes. The Rapid Intel sample cartridge is intended for use with single source crime scene type samples, example saliva and blood. It has improved performance for low level samples. It could be used for blood, drinking containers, cigarette butts, and other similar items, and the runtime is approximately 95 minutes. The instrument is able to determine the, which runtime to use based on the cartridge inserted. Therefore, the user does not have to make adjust run times depending on what cartridge they're using. It's done automatically for you. The Rapid Hit ID system comes with a laptop or desktop which has loaded onto it the RapidLink software. Samples are instantly imported and can be used with the software to generate matches or other investigative leads. So we'll talk a little bit about the RapidLink software now. The RapidLink software can be used to link several instruments to one main computer. 
The map shows the location of each instrument connected to the computer with the RapidLink software. If the location is flagged green, it means the instrument or instruments at that location are all connected and operational. The RapidLink software is used to determine the following. Location, functionality, runs performed per day, and runs performed per instrument. So at the bottom left of the screen with the blue and red bars, this shows the number of runs being performed per day and total across all instruments at that location. Blue means successful runs and red means unsuccessful. At the bottom right, this shows the number of runs performed on each different instrument. In this way, the operator of the software can track the reagent use for each instrument. This allows one central location to be in charge of reordering of reagents and taking the burden off of the users at crime scenes or booking stations. So very similar to Gene um, Mapper, we do have quality flags also on the Rapid ID system. So at the end of the run, a quality flag appears on the screen of the Rapid ID for the sample. The colors are green, which basically means that sizing passed. Um, the profile can be used in all functions of the RapidLink software. Yellow means the sizing also has passed, but does require review before it can be used in all functions of the RapidLink software. And red means that the sizing has failed. These actually are displayed on the instrument itself, so the user is able to tell instantly whether the sample is going to be a good sample, it's going to require review, or may need to be rerun, or if there was some other issue. So regardless of the quality flag displayed on the instrument screen, the run information is transferred to the RapidLink software, and the quality flags are also seen in the software. So as you can see from the image on the right there, the quality flags are duplicated on the software. So if it's green, you'll see a green check mark. If it's yellow, you will see a box with a yellow arrow. And if it is red, you will see a circle with a red X in between. So that's how the quality flags are displayed. In this way, so someone with access to the RapidLink software can monitor the quality of the data coming off the instrument and take any steps necessary in case of a problem taking the burden off the user. So one person at a central location can see all the data coming off of all the different instruments and be able to tell at a glance whether it's good quality data coming off, whether that person perhaps will have to do reviews, or if there's several failures occurring, they can actually address the problem and probably look into some troubleshooting. So therefore, once again, the user, whether it be at a booking station or a crime scene, does not have to take on this burden. Now there's some other features of the RapidLink software. So the RapidLink software has additional apps or applications that can be purchased separately. These apps have the following features. So first you've got the one to the far left is a match app. This can be used to match any DNA profiles that are imported into that computer with the RapidLink software. So all the data being fed into this one computer with the RapidLink software can be, you can use that to generate matches. The familial app can be used to do a familial search of all profiles imported into that RapidLink software. The kinship app can be used to verify a stated relationship between two profiles. And the SED, which app, which stands for the Staff Elimination Database, the DNA profiles from staff members can actually be imported into the RapidLink software and can be automatically compared to profiles imported into the software to check for possible contamination. It is important to note that since many instruments can be connected to one computer with the RapidLink software, one advanced operator can perform all these functions in one central location as opposed to having all the users, whether at a crime scene or booking station, attempting to carry out the analysis. The RapidLink software is built to allow users with minimal training to operate the instrument, while a more advanced user or a DNA analyst, for example, monitors the instruments and checks the quality of the data generated and controlling how the data will be used in an investigation. So let's look at some data generated from the Rapid ID. So some of the studies that we ran on the Rapid ID to measure the performance of the instrument. We did reference samples, which were just simply buckle swabs. We did a sensitivity series based on total nanogram input of DNA. We did another sensitivity series based on the volume of DNA placed on the swab. We did a mixture detection where we were looking for the ability of the instrument to detect a minor. And of course, we had a concordance with the CE 3500 and Seek Studio. 
So here's an example of 20 buckle swabs that were run in the Rapid ID system, which had a 100% first pass success rate. This was done with the ACE cartridge. These samples, first of all, were all concordant with the samples run on the 3500 and the Seat Studio. This means that all swabs registered a green quality flag. It is important to note that for a sample to get a green flag, all alleles must be present and called. Therefore, the first pass success rate means that there were full profiles generated for all the swabs run and no reruns when necessary. For males, the profiles gave all 24 out of 24 alleles, and for females, 22 out of 22. The image here shows how these were displayed on the Rapid Link software screen. From left to right, you have the quality flag, the date and time of the run, the sample name, the cartridge being used, the location, the instrument serial number, and then the user. So a sensitivity series was also done with the total input of DNA. We basically did a range from 1,280 nanograms to 10 nanograms. So from the first sense, so as seen from the heat map, from 1,280 nanograms to 40 nanograms, all alleles were present. For 20 nanograms and 10 nanograms, there were some samples where dropout was detected. Even with dropout, the lowest number of loci detected was 17, which is more than enough for comparison purposes. This allows the great uh, this shows a great dynamic range of the Intel cartridge, and this is useful for high and low level samples. This was done with blood. This makes it especially useful for crime scene samples where the amount of input DNA is not known. So with the rapid hit ID Intel cartridge, you do not have to worry about possibly putting in too much blood or too little blood. It's going to give you a good result either way. We did um, a sensitivity series with sample volumes. And here we have liquid saliva was pipetted onto um, swabs in the volumes of 8 microliters, 4 microliters, 2 microliters, and 1 microliter. And you could see at one microliter of saliva, there was still 85% of alleles present. This shows that Rapid ID is able to handle very low volumes of saliva with still generating enough data to be used for comparison purposes. We also did that with blood samples. Um, we did various volumes of four microliters, two microliters, one microliter, and 0.5 microliters. And once again, from the graph, this shows that even at a volume of 0.5 microliters, 96% of the alleles were detected using the Rapid ID. And this shows that the Rapid ID is suited for detection of DNA from very small samples. For mixture detections, mixtures were run in the Rapid ID in the following proportions 1 to 1, 1 to 4, 1 to 8, and 1 to 16. The Rapid ID consistently detected the presence of the minor at the 1 to 8 proportion. On some samples, the minor was detected at the 1 to 16 proportion. The ability to detect a minor at such low proportions provides utility for crime scene type samples, perhaps indicating the presence of a low level male in a sample with mostly female DNA. And this information can be used by the laboratory to decide how to proceed with further testing. So concordance with the 3500 in the Seek Studio, all samples tested in the following studies gave concordance results with the 3500 in the Seek Studio. So in all studies performed, sensitivity with total nanograms and volumes of blood and saliva, the reference samples and the mixture studies, there was no discordance observed between the allele calls from the Rapid ID and those of the 3500 and the Seek Studio. Now it's important to know the Rapid ID system does not consume the sample. The ACE and Intel cartridges allow easy removal of the swab. Once removed, the swabs can be rerun using traditional methods of extraction, quantitation, amplification, and CE. The samples tested gave full DNA profiles after they were run on the Rapid ID. This allows one swab to be used twice since the Rapid ID does not consume the sample. This becomes very useful if there is a limited number of samples or in cases if two swabs are taken and one fails to give a result. 
So this chart shows samples that were run the rapid ID using the ACE cartridge. The samples were removed from the ACE cartridge and placed in a hood to air dry. The time between when they were run on the rapid ID and then run again using traditional DNA methods ranged from a week to a month. The DNA quantities shown are from the swabs after they were run on the rapid ID. The DNA, in all cases, the samples gave full profiles using traditional CE testing, even with as little as 20 microliters of blood or one swipe of the inner cheek. These samples also gave a full profile on the rapid ID and the results were concordant. So future testing is planned for lower level samples using the Intel cartridge to see if we can also get DNA profiles after it's run on the Intel cartridge with lower level samples. So can these systems be used together? Can they actually be integrated? Well, both of them have a small footprint. Both require little maintenance and both are very easy to run. The rapid ID is ideal for the booking station or crime scene unit, while the Seek Studio is ideal for smaller full service DNA laboratories, but can they exist together? One model would be to have, for example, the rapid ID used for reference casework samples. The ease of use and minimal training required makes it ideal for technicians in the laboratory to process these samples. The high first pass success rate ensures good quality results. In the same laboratory, using robotic extraction platforms like the Automate, with the Quant Studio 5 for quantitation and the Proflex for amplification, and the Seek Studio for CE, only crime scene type samples would need to be processed using traditional DNA methods. This would reduce the number of samples being run through the entire conventional DNA process. So the four capillary system of the Seek Studio should be adequate to meet those needs. By running the reference samples on rapid ID, there will also be a separation of knowns and unknowns and preventing cross contamination between the reference and the question samples. So let's do a little system comparison summary. So the rapid ID system, it has one capillary, whereas in Seek Studio, you have four capillaries. With the rapid ID system, there it's very simple. Obviously, there's no pipetting required. The Seek Studio has easy with one click universal cartridge. The user level of experience for a rapid ID system, a technician or non-technical operator, forensic lab experience is not required for the rapid ID system. For the Seek Studio, a trained forensic scientist or technician can easily operate that system. The runtime is 90 minutes from sample to answer on the rapid ID, whereas the Seek Studio is 39 minutes, which is the CE run. But you also have your upstream processing time, that is DNA extraction, quantification, and STR amplification. Um, sample type, the casework, you have the rapid Intel cartridge. Whereas um, for the Seek Studio, for casework, you have purified DNA. For the database, you can have a reference or rapid ACE cartridge. The database reference, you can have a swab treated or untreated paper for the Seek Studio. And testing environments for the rapid ID system, you can have the forensic laboratory, a satellite laboratory, a mobile CSI unit, or police booking station. For a Seek Studio, you can have obviously a full service forensic science laboratory, or you can have a smaller satellite laboratory, since it does not require as much space. So in conclusions, the question which is the right tool for the job has a simple answer. Both the Seek Studio and Rapid ID as separate units can do the job they're intended to perform. The Seek Studio is a small alternative to the 3500, with the Rapid ID for use at crime scenes and booking stations. However, together they do complement each other, increasing efficiency of the current laboratory or allowing the setup of a smaller satellite laboratory. They are both the right tool for the right job of processing DNA samples. So I just wish to um, thank you and thank um, Thermo Fisher, and we'll turn this back over to Michelle. Thank you, Robert, for that great information and insight. Audience, it is now time for the Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have not already, please take just a moment here to ask Robert and Jamie a question using the Q&A dialog box on your screen. So Robert, let's start with you. What demo opportunities are available to try out these instruments? So 
for basically FIU and FSC and FIU has a relationship with Thermo Fisher Scientific that we are their center of excellence for rapid DNA testing. So what we have at our facility is we actually have two rapid hit ID units um, where we can have people come in and see demonstrations of the units. They can actually run the units themselves. We have reagents available for testing. And especially in this time right now where we're having some issues with COVID and social distancing and so forth, we also do virtual demonstrations via Zoom. We've already done five of those internationally for international laboratories who are wanting to see the units. And then also we have done some for local agencies also. You can bring in your own samples if you want. We have samples here that you can actually prepare yourself and run. And that way you get to actually get some hands-on time with the instrument. We aren't selling it. We are not going to be able, we won't be able to discuss price for that. You're going to have to go to Thermo Fisher Scientific. So really we're just a nice environment for people to come, get some hands-on time with the instrument and get a feel for it and see how best they think they can incorporate it into their laboratory. Okay, great. That sounds awesome. How different is data analysis with the rapid hit compared to traditional CE? Well, the data looks the same. So you get, especially since the rapid ID is using Global Filer Express, so you are going to see your Global Filer data. I have used the 3500 and the Seek Studio, and switching over to the rapid ID, there's really no learning curve involved in looking at the data. It's the same electrophorograms that you're accustomed to seeing. Um, you can see all your peak height balances, your allele calls, your peak heights. You know, basically everything is the same. So there really is no learning curve involved. The data is comparable. Gotcha. That sounds easy. So, Robert, tell us, in your response to COVID-19, have you had extreme difficulty, you know, making your demos virtual? Or what was the process like to go ahead and get that back on for people that aren't able to get to the lab and such? Um, no, the demo's actually been quite easy. We do them over the Zoom format. And we have cameras set up, so we're actually able to run a sample live and then take a sample off so that everybody can actually see the beginning and the end process. And then we move into the software, and we basically go over the software with them, you know, show all the different features of the software. Since it's all live, we can take questions live or we take questions after. We can talk about our experiences with the software or any of the testing that we have done here and, you know, show them the primary cartridge, the sample cartridge, basically anything they need. So we have not really had any issues with transitioning to the Zoom and it's actually able to help us reach a broader audience. Oh, that's great. Yeah, sometimes, you know, in the adaptation to the pandemic, we've definitely found ways to get in touch with each other. So that's really great. Jamie, let's turn our attention to you quickly. The sex studio had fewer spectral artifacts. Do you attribute that to the inclusion of marker-to-marker correction? Yeah, so that is part of the reason. The second level of pull-up reduction offered with the Seek Studio for applied biosystems kits is that marker-to-marker correction factor that you uh, enable by selecting the AB kit that you're running when you're setting up the Seek Studio. But in addition, because the optics are different on the Seek Studio, and I talked about instrument-specific pull-up on the 3500, which has to do with the way the fluorescently labeled molecules move across the detection cell, you don't see that um, due to the optical design on the Seek Studio. So you don't see that type of instrument-specific pull-up, um, which also you know, takes away a portion of the pull-up on the Seek Studio that you see on the 3500 just by the nature of the optical design. Gotcha. Okay. Um, So what is the benefit of using sample-specific spectral versus using the generic spectral? Okay. I'll take it that one's for me, too. Um, So using the sample-specific spectral, so that is um, how the pull-up reduction algorithms are working. Um, The benefit is that you're doing more of an apples to apples comparison when you're using a matrix to deconvolute the dye data from your sample. So when you use a manual calibration or the traditional spectral calibration that we set up on the 3500, remember those dyes are are pure dyes. They're not attached to any fragments. So it's more of an orange to apples correction. Um, And when you use sample specific data, you're actually getting a matrix based on dyes that are connected to fragments of DNA, just like your sample 
Um, so that's where that more apples to apples um, deconvolution comes in. Gotcha. Okay. Robert, let's get you back in the fold. Um, do you have any data testing touch DNA samples on the rapid hit? So we haven't really done a full study on the rapid and touch DNA. I mean, from what I showed you, yes, we planted like as low as one microliter of saliva onto a swab and we were able to get a result. We have done stuff here with, you know, basically cell phones, but it's just been like maybe just one cell phone, one firearm. We've done water bottles, cigarette butts. And we've gotten good results. We, basically, we've gotten results that we're able to definitely eliminate someone and even go so far as to make an inclusion with it. We do have plans to do larger studies to encompass a lot more scenarios. So and that's also something that, you know, from the community, if you ever have any ideas, if there's any need that you think that you would like to use a rapid ID for, and you can send those directly to me. When we design a study, we can try our best to include your suggestions so that when we do produce something, it'll be something that actually the community wants to see and not just something that we sat down here and thought would be best. We're always looking for suggestions on what we can do to make um, our studies better. That sounds great. Um, all right, Jamie, over to you. How does the Seek Studio do with difficult matrix, mixtures? Um, did you get the same results compared to 3500? I will answer from the Seek Studio developmental validation that we did. We did look at some mixtures. Um, we focused on two person mixtures up to one to seven and seven to one mixture ratios. And the performance was similar uh, between the 3500 and the Seek Studio. I'm not sure if Robert had any more experience in the work he did, but. So we only did for right now, just a two person mixture down to the one to 16. And we got comparable results between the 3500 and the Seek Studio. So they performed the same. We could do that later on, doing more complicated mixtures, three and four person mixtures, but we just did a two person and the lowest proportion we did was one to 16. Okay, great. Um, and now you guys can both answer this question based on the instruments that you talked about. So Robert, um, we'll start with you. What is the performance of rapid hit in analyzing samples exposed to extreme environments? So, We've done limited testing on that. I don't know if we've done anything with extreme environments, to be 100% honest with you. That is, once again, something that we are going to be doing more testing on because we do have those questions. I know we've done some teeth, but they were from bodies that were like left were in the ocean and they didn't perform well, whereas teeth that were dried and even for 30 years were stored in a dried environment, we actually got results on. But just respect to like extreme heat or mold or bacteria, or we have not really done a lot of those studies yet. It's still a study in progress, what we do here. So like I said, once again, anything, there's any environments or any conditions that people specifically want to know about, please let us know so that when we do plan these studies, we can incorporate them into our testing. Great. And Jamie, what about you? What was the performance of Seek Studio like in analyzing samples exposed to extreme environments? So we actually just released a uh, application note as it relates to bone testing. And in that application note, we talk about bones that have been exposed to some harsh environments, um, formic acid. There are some DVI cases in that case study. Um, and that's focused on the rapid hit ID with our Intel cartridges. And um, performance for some of those lower quality bone samples that were exposed to harsh conditions um, wasn't as great as the better quality samples where we may only have seen a partial profile or just a few peaks to no peaks. We also put out a poster that ran some of the same bone samples on the Seek Studio using a prep filer BTA extraction. And the bone performed those low quality bone samples exposed to harsh conditions for that subset of data. I think there were 18 different bones um, did fare better uh, on the Seek Studio in the traditional CE workflow than in the rapid workflow. I'm not sure if we have the contact information of the person who asked that question, but I'd be happy to send both the application note and the poster um, to them so that they could have a closer look at the at the data. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, audience, don't worry. We do have your info from when you registered. So Jamie could definitely get that info to you, which is very kind. All right, next one, Jamie. You mentioned the J6T die set. Our audience member, David, saw that it has the TED die. 
instead of the Ned die from the earlier J6 die set? It, what was this? Was this just an upgrade, or does each die set apply to different STR kits? Yeah, so it, it is a, a die change. Um, the TED die is a slightly quieter die. It'll still fluoresce in the yellow die channel. We have certain kits that are designed using the J6T dies in particular. Um, that is our uh, Verifiler uh, Plus kit. And one of our kits that is used solely with our Chinese customers, um, Global Filer, Global Filer IQC, those are both J6, our original J6, and NGM Detect um, is a J6T die set um, also. That's used mostly by our European customers. Gotcha. Okay. Robert, we have um, a few questions about RapidKit coming up for you. So tell us, does the rapid hit ID automatically check the hit in the DNA database? If you have the application, so with the rapid ID and the rapid link software, if it's in the rapid link software, it automatically imports the profiles from the instrument into the software. And then you'll have the different applications. So the matching software, you actually have to ask it, tell it to make a match. For the familial, you can do a familial search where it'll search basically everything that's in the rapid link for a familial uh, match. For the kinship, you have to put the stated relationship of what you basically you're checking to make sure that that relationship is what it's supported to be. The only thing it automatically searches is the staff elimination database. So once you set up your staff elimination database and you have those people in there, Anytime you run a sample, it'll automatically tell you if that person profile, if the profile developed, ends up matching someone in the staff elimination database. Okay. Well, we're getting close to time here. So, Jamie, I'm going to ask you the last question. Do you advise having Seek Studio for a lab with many samples? So the Seek Studio is a four cap instrument. Um, so a lab would definitely want to consider their throughput when, you know, deciding what CE option would be best for them, whether they're a high throughput lab and maybe a 3500 Excel with 24 caps might be the right answer. Or, you know, if they could um, use the Seek Studio with the four caps to meet their throughput needs. Of course, compared to the rapid hit ID, you're talking about four capillaries versus a single capillary. But then again, you may have some more upfront steps um, to do before running those four samples on the CE. So it all depends on the overall workflow um, and then looking at the lab's throughput and needs, I think, when you're making that decision. All right, audience, that about wraps up all the time we have today. I'd like to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific for sponsoring this webinar, our speakers Robert and Jamie, and of course you, the audience, for your attendance and participation. In 48 hours, this webinar will be available on demand if you would like to watch it again or share it with friends and colleagues. Additionally, you will receive an email with information on how to obtain CE credit documentation for your participation today. The fourth webinar in this six-part Future Trends in Forensic DNA Technology series will be held on August 20th at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. You can register for tips, tricks, and best practices for gaining efficiency in your forensic DNA laboratory on the Forensic website, www.forensicmag.com, where you can also view other webinars in this series on demand. Thank you and have a wonderful day.